Paul was uh, very good friends with my husband in New York way before he even thought of doing a movie in Los Angeles. And they both did short films. And uh, I saw Paul's short film, which was called Secret Cinema. And it's an amazing film. And I immediately became paranoid because my husband was filming me in another. And I thought, well, this is a film about me, too. And, you know, everybody's laughing somewhere. It's, it's all a joke. And there's no film in the camera. And, uh, and then he said, now I'm going to take you to meet Paul. And, of course, <laughs> Paul is this, I don't know, you just immediately like him. He, he's just so warm and so there's no pretense or anything. It's, oh, hello, Mary. Uh, and uh, the three of us were friends in New York. And um, he called me much later and said, oh, Mary, uh, if you were to come out here, I know I could get you a part in this new movie I'm doing, which was called Death Race 2000. Just wear tight pants. I know when Roger looks at your legs, he's uh, going to hire you. So I went there, and I said, you know, are my pants tight enough? Oh, Mary, you look great. Um, we sat down in a very dark movie theater. Roger had a fight with somebody because they laughed, and it was supposed to be a horror movie. And he laughed and never looked at my legs, much less my face. And um, then Paul called me up and said I was hired. Um, that was the beginning of my career with Roger. And Death Race 2000, of course, was a joke. It was, it was this, it was comedy, but it wasn't comedy, which is perfect for Paul and I, because that's what we have. I mean, it's like we're very serious, but obviously we're out of our minds. So Death Race 2000 was a combination of that and wonderful Corman cheapness. The thing is, is that Roger doesn't like humor. Roger's movies are, they don't try and pull the wool over the audience's eye. They, you know, the nudity in the movies is very, um, you know, tits and ass, you know, very homey, very, you know, you get just what you expect. The horror is for real horror. And the, uh, there's a cheapness to the movie that makes you feel that, you know, they're not, they're not, showing you something that's real. You can tell the jokes, you know, you can tell when, when someone's, uh, you know, using ketchup instead of blood. I mean, and it makes everybody happier, and, and that's why the movies are so much fun. So he had a tremendous ongoing fight with Paul about comedy. Meanwhile, the whole movie's hysterical. And it's also very, you know, uh, subversive. I think that Roger liked. Roger recognized that. But Roger's constant complaint was, you know, more blood. Uh, why isn't there more blood? I mean, you know, what about real killing? And Paul's thing was, well, no, no, no. We, I mean, you know, we're, we're running over a pregnant nun. Uh, blood would be too much. I had been doing rep theater for a couple of years. I'd, I had graduated from, from uh, Cal State Fresno. And um, I was doing theater around California. And one of the places that I worked was with uh, Luis Valdez's company. Luis Valdez did uh, Zoot Suit. And um, uh, he was preparing the film while I was working on this play with him. So he asked me to come to Los Angeles to do a very small part in his movie. Um, while I was here, I met the casting director that you're talking about, Eugene Blythe. Uh, nice, nice guy. And he said, Robert, uh, because I w had an audition, and uh, he said, Robert, you're not really right for this role, but I have another thing for you you're perfect for. And I was very disappointed because I really wanted to be in this play, right? So he said, I'll have the director call you. So I was really broke, and I, I went back to Bakersfield, where I was, where, you know, where I grew up, and um, <clears throat> living with my mom, and, uh, you know, sleeping till 12 and whatever, you know. But uh, one day I got a call from Paul. I didn't, uh, I, I had totally forgotten about what B e Eugene had said about this, this other thing. So um, I got on the phone and he goes, uh, Hi, Robert. This is Paul Bartell. How are you? I said, I'm fine. Uh, what's this about? He said, uh, well, I'm really interested in you for my film, Eating Raul. 
And I said, what? You know, because Eugene never, didn't tell me any titles or anything like that. So <laughs> I said, what? No, no man, I, I don't do those kind of films. I, I, I'm not interested. He goes, no, no, no. It's completely legitimate. And I said, okay, well, uh, well what else have you done? It's rather cheeky in those days. Um, he said, what else have you done? And he said, well, uh, you might have seen uh, Secret Cinema. Or, and I said, no. And... Um, you might have seen him mention another one. And I said, uh, no. And he said, finally, he says, uh, well, maybe you saw Death Race, Death Race 2000. And I said, oh, man, you, you did Death Race 2000? He says, yes, that was me. And I said, well, okay, where do I go to meet you? Because you know, I coincidentally had just seen it maybe two nights before at the drive-in theater in Bakersfield the terrace drive-in. And um, I had to see it twice because I was with this girl, you know. We didn't see very much of it at the, at the first showing. But it seemed really interesting enough to st stick around for the second showing, right? And I uh, just laughed. It was, so, it was so funny. After Death Race 2000, I made Rock and Roll High School and Paul was in it also. And something weird happened. In that movie, we became a team. Pretty soon, everybody in Roger Roger's place was using us as a team, and we became sort of this Mr. and Mrs. team, which I didn't mind, but I should have. Um, that gave Paul the idea of why do, why why can, why do we have to be a team in everybody's movie? Why don't we just do our own movie? And he went to Roger, and Roger said no. But Roger's like that, you know. There comes a time when you graduate from Roger Corman's school. Paul was so hot to do this that uh, he went to Germany and took Dick Blackburn and they wrote a script together. Um, and then they came back and they showed me because Paul was going to make this movie. When he showed me the script, you know, I looked at it and, well, number one, I'm married to Paul. I don't think so. Number two, it was just a setup to have sex scenes. And I really don't like, you know, I'm not, you know, let's display my tits, girl. And they said, no, no, Mary, it's fine, it's fine, it's fine. And I had no, nothing else to do. And so Paul was going to shoot, you know, a little bit here, a little bit here, a little bit here, because he had no money. And so we met. He gave me the script of Eating Raoul. I, um, I read it with some friends, actor friends of mine, and uh, we laughed. And I said, look, you guys, should I... Should I, should I audition for it? It's kind of weird, isn't it? It's, I mean, I thought it was really funny, but it was so offbeat, you know. And they said, ah, Robert, what else are you doing? I said, you're right. Uh, so I called, <laughs> I called up Paul, and I said, I would love to read for this. So he arranged a, a, a dinner, actually, with me and Mary and Dick Blackburn to meet, and um, a lot of wine, and we had a great time drank way too much, and uh, we read through the script. And I have to, I have to credit Mary. Um, evidently, when I left the, the meeting, um, they were like, well, he's really young. He doesn't have any experience. And, and she said, are you guys crazy? He is, he's the guy. He's Raul. This man that Paul was going to cast was old, and he was going to fake a, a uh, Mexican accent. Uh, Blackburn and I went crazy. We uh, jumped up and down, screamed, yelled, and Paul was going, no, 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 I, I feel this is, you know, he can be blind, you know, I feel this is the right thing. And here is Robert, he's drop-dead gorgeous, and Paul's not using him. I mean, it, it, to Blackburn and I, it, it didn't, just because you have a friend, so what? I mean, this guy is, I mean, we need some sex appeal. I mean, you know, I'm... <laughs> I'm like a little, you know, a bizarre at least, but Robert was just like, you know, dripping in sex, and I, we just couldn't understand it. And I mean, we literally screamed at him. The next morning I got a call from Paul, and said, Robert, we would like for you to be our Raul. And I went, yes, all right. Once Robert was cast, Paul was, this is fabulous. I mean, it was so simple. Once, once we started acting with him, it was just great. He did everything. He was a, also glue that hung us together. 
Without him, it would be kind of boring. For me, definitely, it would be kind of boring. Those are my only sex scenes. Also, you know, Robert, there's, there's something about, you know, he just sort of, you know, brings out sort of this, like, girl thing in me, you know, like, oh, let's smoke pot, uh-huh. Oh, I don't know, what are we doing? <laughs> I mean, and then we end up in bed together, and, you know, what do we do? He was funny. He was just really great. So, um, you know, little did I know the, the journey that was going to be, you know. Because <laughs> I, I was still under the impression, the impression that you made films, you know, one week, weeks consecutively, not, you know, months in between. As we shot the movie, the movie formed itself. First of all, we had no money. The first thing we did was the guy, and I'm supposed to be his mother, and we sit on the couch. Obviously, that is hysterical. And uh, from then on, we just had our routine down, you know. I was surprised when I, when I showed up on the set and Ed Begley was there and Edie McClure was there and uh, so many of those great actors were in the, in the film. And um, it kind of gave me confidence in my taste because I thought, hey, well, maybe it was a good choice. You know, maybe, maybe this really is a, a funny, funny script. Uh, I was part of a group called the uh, Groundlings, which was uh, an improv group, and uh, I know that Paul likes to, you know, uh, not work from a totally written script, but is ready to play with uh, the players. And um, so we went to, a friend and I went to visit him on the set, and because he was already shooting something, and uh, he says, well, we'd, we'd like to have you. And I said, oh, well, okay, what are we going to do? And he says, well, you know, you're an improv person. You'll make it up as you go along. And I said, okay. So John Paragon also was in the Groundlings, and he ended up, uh, I think he's the sex uh, store vendor. So we knew that we weren't going to get any money out of it. But we were going to be in a movie. So I was the swinger in fur. <laughs> And so I used a really high little voice, you know, like this. And we just wanted to know if you want to come and have some little fun. And uh, so we did the scene, and they set it up, and I saw all these people in robes. And, uh, and then they had me sit down on my husband's lap, and then and my action was to get up and go toward, you know, Paul and Mary and uh, prefer, you know, a get-together with us. Now, what I didn't know <laughs> was behind me, all of the people in robes, when they said, all right, ready to shoot, they all took off their robes, and they were naked behind me. And then we would finish the take, and they'd say, all right, uh, cut, and the people would put their robes back on, and then I would turn around and go sit on my husband's lap again. I didn't know that they were taking off their clothes behind me <laughs> in the scene. I had no idea that there were naked people in the scene because I was always had my back to them when they took off their robes. So that was interesting to see that film the first time and realize, oh my God, those people are naked behind me. <laughs> the other thing is that I was so... I realized, you know, the sex scenes are going to be fine. There's no nudity. And as a matter of fact, there was nudity. But I didn't care by that time because I knew the movie was really good. But the other thing is that I completely stymied sex between Paul and I. You know, it was like, oh, darling. <laughs> it was like that kind of thing. And Paul, it was perfect for us, just perfect, because Paul is... He's not a sexy guy. He has, he has a nice front, you know, and that's the way it is. And it's, 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 he's, he's not a lewd man. He just isn't. But that's the best way to ridicule something is with humor. And he was good at it. Not only does he satirize uh, the middle class viciously, and it's not the middle class, it's the American middle class. It's the American puritanical middle class, you know, that can't stand the idea of sex, but is completely oblivious to their own problems. Murder is fine. Robbing people is fine. Selling all their cars is just great. Money really, really looks good. I don't think Paul decided to write a script 
where it was a giant sat. It, it happened organically. It was not pre-planned. Uh, well, Paul, of course, was in the film. So when Paul would say his line, he would be acting. And then immediately he dropped his, you know, character and was just watching you as you were doing the lines. So he just kept flipping back and forth. His, his uh, aura became, uh, I'm an actor now, now I'm a director. Now I'm an actor, now I'm a director. So, because he was just peering at me, so you know, piercingly, because as the director, he was wanting, you know, to get what he wanted. And uh, it was kind of hard to play with because he kept dropping character to study me while I was talking. He really knew what he wanted. And um, he didn't spend much time um, if, he, if he felt the scene was there. So um, I know in the final scene, uh, at least my final scene, where I get popped over the head by the f frying pan, um, that was like one take, I think. We rehearsed it quickly for camera. We did one take. And um, I believe that was it. He, Great, that was great. And I said, well, Paul, uh, are you sure? I'd really like it. No, 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 that was wonderful. So, uh, you know, you really have to trust somebody. And in this film, you know, there's only room for one take, so you just throw yourself into it. I mean, he didn't have a lot of takes. That's when takes cost money. Other times, we didn't have money for an actor. I mean, we dressed the sound man up as a woman because <laughs> he was this big guy, this giant guy. and. He, he's the one where you open up the door and, I don't know, Paul just bots him with a, with a frying pan. That's the sound guy. I mean, we used everybody. We used the, the grip for the guy who comes in, you know, with the animal lunch or whatever it is in the hospital because some guy is trying to molest me. He's not an actor. We used, uh, you name it, we used it. Whatever. Whatever we could. And it became fun. Paul, while we were shooting, said, you know, Robert, I love the Lady Killers, and I'm sure you've seen that film, and Kind Hearts and Coronets. And I hadn't seen those films. So, <laughs> um, so that's what I'm, that's kind of what I'm trying to get. I only saw the films after, and uh, then I understood what he was trying to do and wh why those films were um, kind of influential on his, uh, on the script. The biggest influence uh, in preparing for my role, Raoul, was uh, remembering George C. Scott's performance in Dr. Strangelove, because he was so obsessed, right? It was, it was hilarious. Just his total commitment to the obsession, right? Uh, besides his great timing, he's a great comedian, a great actor, George C. Scott. Um, and I thought, that's what I need to do. I need to bring that kind of obsession to the role, and then the comedy will come out of that. So I, I really didn't uh, strive for laughs. I just thought, they're, they're there, you know, if you just hit the right, the right note in the scene. Obviously, being a Latino in the showbiz um, comes with certain uh, preconceived ideas, which was new to me because in college, I played Macbeth, I played restoration comedy, I, I think I played one Latino role in college out of a huge amount of theater that I did. So um, to come to Los Angeles and then have my agent says, well, there's a drug dealer that you can audition for here. There's a this and this. And I was like, God, this is really depressing. The Raul role, though, was really a lucky strike for me because um, it was a comedy, you know, and so Comedy calls for a certain amount of performance, a certain amount of panache, and uh, so I was able to demonstrate that. I, I remember having an argument with a stand-up comedian who I went to go see, and he was just awful, and he was doing these self-deprecating Mexican jokes, right? And um, afterwards, he was like, hey, how was it? I said, man, how can you do that? How can you do that material? It's... Aren't, uh, did you have any pride? And he was like, well, hey, man, you did Eating Raul. I was like, but totally different thing, man. You know, uh, everybody looked bad in Eating Raul. 
know, believe it or not, <laughs> I'm this uh, cult figure. I go to these, you know, things where you just sign your name, you know, uh, and they know every movie. They know Terror Vision. Oh, that's the punk rock thing. They know, you know, The Night of the Comet. I mean, these people keep track of these movies. They become, it's like Star Trek, you know, they keep track of everything. And then all of a sudden it builds and it builds and all of a sudden it's, it's, uh, it's popular again. It happened to, to Eating Raul. There's just a cult that follows it, that. Well, I mean, it hits on, it still hits on some very current uh, themes like uh, greed, you know, Give me, I want mine, uh, no matter what it takes to get it. I'm going to have the life that I want, that I feel I deserve, and if I have to hurt some people on the way up, that's too damn bad. And um, so it, it still has uh, resonance, definitely. And I'm very proud of it now. And before I was always, you know, oh, well, well. But I've written, you know, six books, and uh, I paint, I always paint. My paintings are not like conceptual art, thank you, which I hate. And I've always, you know, poo-pooed my acting, but I like it now. I think I did well. And I wish that Paul had done more. When we did it, we didn't think about it. It's all wasted. I mean, now I can look back and say, you know, wow, mm -hmm, that was great wine, you know, but when we did it, it was, you know, just like, oh, yeah. <laughs> On class struggle, he was mostly talking about Buñuel and uh, the discreet charm of the bourgeoisie, right? Another film which I hadn't seen. <laughs> um, but again, the script was so clear what, what was needed, you know? Um, and that was, that was very sort of French Farsi, you know. I really think that Paul realized he made a mistake by not using all of us again. And so he decided to use everybody again. But it wasn't the same because the scriptwriter was very tight about his words. There was no ad-libbing. There was no joking around. The set was, the set was tight and hard. It wasn't loose and funny. I mean, we would laugh at our own ideas. No, it was tight and hard and, and, and difficult. Um, when I was doing Star Trek Voyager, w the last time I saw him, he was directing something on the lot, and he came by, and we, had, we were able to have lunch together. And it was really great because uh, I didn't know that he really knew what, how people liked him, you know, and knew him. And, and so everybody was on the set was really excited to see him, you know, to meet him. And we went and had lunch, and we were followed by the rest of the cast and the crew, and they were like, Paul Bartel, it's Paul Bartel. And so we had a wonderful lunch, and they were asking him a lot of questions, and he had a really good time. And uh, the last time I, I saw him was him walking back to his set to direct. When he died... Uh, one of the things he said to me is, I'm not sorry, I, I had a really good time. I really, you know, he loved to indulge himself. And he did have a good time. And he died like a man. He wasn't, you know, weeping and moaning in some hospital, you know. He came home and died.